Listen, uh, what I want to do, I'm just going to turn to you on and ask you guys in a minute. Everybody just give two or three minutes to what the word covenant relationships means to you. And I just want to introduce that for a second. Um, you know, I wrote a book called Covenant Relationships some 30 years ago. It was a great idea. And um, the covenant relationships is a commitment to a relationship. It's a commitment to a long-term relationship. And I remember when we, when I started in, in, in reading the Bible and, and feeling one of the first things about Hebraic roots is that the word faith doesn't mean philo philosophical faith. It means covenantal faith. It means you're entering into a faith and into a covenant and you believe in one another. That it, uh, having a, a philosophical faith just didn't, didn't seem to make sense that that's how you could get saved. But when you understand that you're entering in, like you enter into a marriage covenant, that's the kind of faith we have. And what we mean by that is simply that we live by two principles, loyalty in our relationships and integrity in our actions. Loyalty in our relationships and integrity in our actions. That's how we live a life of, of covenantal relationships. And it means that, that we have, okay, I thought somebody was going to say. So, um, one thing I wanted to say is that when we realized over 40 years ago with a lot of these people's fathers <laughs> that God was calling us to something bigger than we were. And we had to figure out how could we stay together. And we realized that one thing is to understand that we have covenantal relationship. And if you understand that you have a covenantal type relationship, then it's going to stay. Because if it's just on feeling, then you're going to leave. And we said, it, we, got, we know God's calling us to something bigger than us, and it's going to take a long time to do it, and we need to stay together, and a framework that you're committed to one another through a covenantal type relationship of faithfulness and integrity, that was the way that we could work together. Well, that sounded great 40 years ago, but here we are, 40, 45 years later, going into second and third generation of people that we've been walking together, serving the Lord together. I want to say what you're looking at right now is not a theory. It's not my book. This is a reality. And that's what we want to unveil right now. This is a reality because the last thing I'm going to say, I'm going to turn to you guys, get ready. And that is that there's something that we believe that the body of Christ needs. And that is this long-term faithfulness to one another that goes into generation, that says, I do want your success. And I do want our togetherness. And I want to transfer it to the next generation. Your success, our togetherness, transfer it to the next generation. One more time. I want your success. I want us to be together. I want it to be transferred to the next generation. We look around. We thought everybody believed this. But we look around, I, it's hard to find an example anywhere. And we don't want to teach about it. We want to, re, we want to unveil it and we want to release it. And I just believe something's going to happen right now in the name of Yeshua. Okay, guys, a couple minutes for each one. What does covenant relationship mean to you? Who wants to start? Yeah, and say who you are if you don't have. Good. Guy, you got it. Go ahead. Uh, Guy Cohen, uh, Ako Israel. Um, I grew up at Tents of Mercy uh, with Eitan Shishkov. He's part, part of the trio, uh, Asher, and Eitan, and Dan. Um, actually, a few years ago, we, uh, let's say 12 years ago, uh, we were so far from each other. And um, as Francis uh, spoke about a uh, startup, you know, in uh, San Francisco, in Israel, we are called Startup Nation. And we always like to invent new things. And uh, personally, I also like to invent the wheel, you know, even that it already exists. So I, I saw that, you know, Eitan uh, is my spiritual father, but uh, uh, Asher is uh, like the, uh, the far, far away uncle. And uh, we don't have a relationship, you know, 
And so, and also Dan, I remember uh, uh, I've, I've met it for you a tough life, you know, at the beginning. But right now we are in a very, very strong relationship because of time. We need to invest time to be together. And um, we grew up in tents of mercy, and we have a family, uh, Avi Shalom, Leon, Guy, Eitan, and we have a, a network of congregations in the Galilee, but then we need to be connected to Asher and Jerusalem. And I can tell you something, Asher. In Israel, we have a problem of uh, division. Uh, the pastors, they are in islands, you know, each one has his own territory and uh, all this. And then when you and Eitan and uh, Dan came together and said, we want you to come together, it was easy for us to connect with the congregations in Tel Aviv, the congregations in Jerusalem, the ministries in Israel. Why? Thanks to your fatherhood. Thanks to your relationship. It's so beautiful to see that. And I'm longing for the next generation that will, they will walk in this unity that you, you show us this example. You know, it's not perfect. I see you fighting with each another and disagree and yelling, you know, all this, but it's beautiful. Uh, yeah, I know, I know, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? That's what's beautiful. Love is covering everything. Even that you are yelling, there is a big hug. We love you. Hey, hey guy, <clears throat> guy, I remember we were talking once and I got upset about it and I started yelling and you looked at me and you said, I sure I can yell better than you can. <laughs> And I said, I said, you know what? You're right. I repent. <laughs> but I want to also say is that there was an attitude. I remember when we came to you all, and I mean, every, every single one of you was of coming and saying, I know you don't understand this yet, but I have a covenantal relationship with your spiritual dad. I have a covenantal relationship with your dad. And you don't understand, I will be loyal to you to the death, whether you receive it or not, because that's there. That's what we believe in. And that kind of, and it takes a while for that to sink in. It doesn't, the first is, oh, come on, get out of my life. Who are you? But then it's, wait a minute. That's true. Amen. Joy, go ahead. Well, Ron, I remember when Asher and Dan were yelling at each other, and then you stood up and yelled at them for yelling at each other. That was... <laughs> That's my summary of covenant relationships right there. Uh, my name's Troy Wallace. Uh, my mom and dad are in the back there. Uh, helped plant the congregation alongside of the in-traders uh, in the 80s before they went to Israel. Um, and really, you know, you, you already said most of it, Guy. It's, it's covenant, covenantal relationships is about fatherhood. It's about motherhood. Uh, it's about longevity. It's about commitment. Um, and Matthew and I were in Ethiopia 10 days ago, ministering together to 100 leaders who lead Messianic Jewish congregations among the black Jews of Ethiopia, um, which would be a whole nother seminar if we started explaining that to you. But we were standing there together ministering because of his father connecting to a man named Gerald Gotson of blessed memory who brought Rabbi Jonathan Burnus into this whole thing with the Ethiopian Jewish community. And we were there together. Matthew, ha have we ministered in a conference setting before? I, I don't think we've actually been on the docket together. Um, but we were ministering together out of this great place of intimacy because of the faithfulness of Asher and David connected to Jonathan, and we just stepped into it. Um, and that was like an embodiment moment of this principle of covenantal relationships. And Asher said this thing just a minute ago about loyalty. You know, my parents made a pledge of commitment of loyalty to him when I was eight. I didn't really have much of a choice at that time. When I was 13, I tried to exercise that choice, but I'm still here today. Um, <laughs> but through the years, then there was the moment where I could choose to affirm that. Um, and then I brought my wife into the equation. I remember, Asher, the first time you sat with my wife. Oh. Was that good or bad? I didn't get what that, what that joke was there. <laughs> I don't usually cry when things are bad. I only cry when things are good. Um, and her being brought into it, and then, you know, our son 
at his at his Brit Milah. You had just left for I Israel right before that, and now our daughter's bat mitzvah is coming up in a couple of months. There's just this longevity because of a commitment that was transacted actually in the generation ahead of me that then I had to, the chance to affirm and chose to do so. And my prayer is, of course, that my children would do the same. So that's our sphere here. But the question for you is, where is that place? And I think most of us can connect to our family history and connect that in a story. But Francis, just thinking about you as a minister, talking about startup and newness and all that stuff, that's the thing I think that impacts me in my ministry life, who I am as a minister, uh, is that it's, it goes before me. You know, I, I get a lot of stuff. Hey, you know what? I've, I've given some nice three-point teachings that really are my own three points, but all of that is derived from something that precedes me. Uh, and an awareness of that and being able to carry that has so much uh, more depth to it, more gravitas. I mean, again, I could go down the line here. Actually, even with, with you, Guy, who's a Cohen from, from Morocco, which is also my wife's family. Cohen's from Morocco. And we met the first time in Israel. We didn't know each other, but we had all this family history that immediately connected us, not just in the Tikkun world, but also Morocco and Cohen. And so again, I'm saying that back to you. Where's the place for you in your life where you can express those kinds of values? And for some of you, it might be going back to a spiritual father or mother in repenting. <laughs> that might be the first place that that unlocks. And for the others of you, it might just be saying yes in a deeper way to a place where you're already ministering and where you're already connected. So I, I don't know. Amen. I was I on the I just want to say one last thing. Uh, that, that I remember when, when Troy was on, Jonathan, I don't remember, if, I'm sure you remember this. Troy was on staff with us and Jonathan offered him a job. And, and uh, Troy comes to me and says, well, I should, uh, Jonathan's offered me a job. <laughs> we said it's a good job, sir. Yeah, it's a good job. It's a good job. I looked down and I said, you know what? He's got a better job for you than I can offer you. And we said, you know what? Let's go sit down. And we sat down together. And we said, Jonathan, this is not just a job offer. This is family. And we'll say, this is my son. I want to give you to him. And this is not just transferring jobs. This is a, a family interaction. And that's when, and actually, Troy helped bond us together, together more through that. Amen. Go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, my name's Matthew Rudolph, and uh, I'm here representing, actually, my brothers and sisters and uh, a family. Put your hands up, all the, all the clan there, here. the rest of you married there. And also, also a, a missional tribe that's scattered around the world that have, like, lives this value out. And, you know, often I think we, we want to define things of spiritual life. And some things we get good definitions of, but it's better to describe it. You know, Yeshua didn't give a definition of the kingdom of heaven. He described the kingdom of heaven is like. And for me, there's so many stories I could think with Asher, with, with Dan and Eitan and uh, Papa Don Fento and my own physical dad that embody this idea of covenant relationships. But maybe just one that comes to mind. I'd heard about Don Fento, who was one, one of the fathers of this movement, and uh, from my parents, and before I met him, he was larger than life, you know, and, uh, and he's a big man and a strong man, and I can remember, I, I think I was 19, 20 years old, came to a conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico, my parents said, hey, this is Don, who we've told you about, and he stopped in the middle of the hallway, and he grabbed both of my hands, and crushed them in his large hands. And he looked me in the eye and he pulled my hands like this up to his chest. And he said, and he, I think he quoted like a whole chapter of Isaiah by memory, looking me in the eyeballs. And then he said, son, when God raises you up and the calling of God on your life grows, I pledge to you that I will not be like Saul was but I will be behind you promoting and pushing you forward in your success as a true son in the faith. I hadn't done anything yet in ministry, 
but it wrote covenant on my heart by that grip on his hands, the look in his eyes, the words that he spoke. Later on, he married my wife and I and uh, has been a mentor and a father, just like all these others. This is a picture of what covenant looks like. In its generational expression, something solidifies from the theory of covenant relationships to a tangible, familial expression. And that's what we're here to embody today. It's not just a theory. It's not just a good teaching. But it's living stones. It's, it's, it's living letters that we're living in. It out before the Lord, and we are longing, and we're, it's a cry of our heart everywhere we go, is to, to extend the family, to extend the family of the Lord. That's what God, I believe, is, is doing at this Perfect. time. Just one snapshot Perfect. of coming. Matthew, amen. Go ahead, Nathan. My name is Nathan Wilbur. My dad is Paul Wilbur. Something just fell over there. Um, this is something that's very deep on my heart. It's a lifestyle covenant. For 18 years, I worked for my dad running his office, and then three years ago, I was asked to work for a church, so I'm now a pastor, trying to instill this over there. And Francis, if you could please come and help me talk to your people, it'd be a great help to me. <laughs> because this is something that's been so deep on my father and Asher's heart. You know, I look across this row, and just like everyone said, I can go down and and name something I have with everybody, and he's even now a neighbor in my neighborhood. But this demonstration of covenant isn't about what I can get from him or from Ron or from Ash or anybody. Covenant is about what can I bring and what can I do for you. It's to come without an agenda. And I've witnessed this at such a very young age. I would enjoy sitting in the living room, and Asher and my dad would just be praying in the spirit, crying out for a move of the Lord. And it's just the two of them and they're drinking coffee. And my mom and who I call Aunt Betty uh, at the house and they're helping him make the table prepared so that we can all have a meal afterwards. But, you know, this was something that was birthed in me at such a young age. It's not something that I jump in covenant and I jump out. I'm 42 years old. This is something that I live. It's my lifestyle because I saw it demonstrated between my father and others. And then when, because of covenant, it was something that sustained me. Just real briefly, when I was in Israel, and I was like, Lord, what am I going to do with my life? I thought I had it all planned out, and there was a pretty good plan, and it led me to Haifa. But everything quickly deteriorated, and I'm praying out, I'm like, God, what am I going to do? Literally, my little cell phone rang on orange beak talk, <laughs> and it was a, a voice of covenant calling to check on me. It was Asher. And he says, how are you doing? What can I do to help you? He wasn't like, hey, how can I get you to Jerusalem? And what can you participate and add to the discipleship I'm doing here, which is pretty cool. And I just, it broke me because it was like covenant is sustaining me in a moment where I feel left alone. And there's nothing. I'm not near my family. My family is back in the States. And I was just walking the sidewalk by myself. And the voice of covenant called and said, what can we do for you? And I got to Jerusalem right away. They housed me. They made sure I wasn't going to be homeless. And even to today, covenant sustains me. When my dad and I were walking this out with this church, trying to bridge this gap between the Jew and Gentile, how we're all one around the table and how beautiful it is. And then covenant was broken with my father, and there's a ripple effect when that happens. And my dad was just going through a really difficult situation, and the one voice that called to check on him was Asher. And covenant sustained him. And it kept me there because I knew that I had to stick out with the calling of God on my life no matter what because I knew that covenant would also sustain me. And so when you see this covenant going from generation to generation, it's real. And sometimes it's hurtful and it's painful because when you experience the opposite, the breaking of covenant, when someone has the, an agenda and they're trying to use you for accomplishing something, it's difficult. But what the Lord is calling us to constantly do is to affirm the covenant that he's made with us. He's given us everything that we need 
in the covenant. And he even made a covenant with him by himself with Abraham so that it would be kept regardless if Abraham or anyone following would break it because the Lord was birthing a family for the, all the nations to come together to do what we're doing in this room and to say, Baruch haba Shem Adonai in one voice in unity. And so, Ash, I just want to honor you and thank you. I'm sorry I'm a little emotional, but it's something that's kind of fresh. <laughs> but if we will hold to the biblical truths of what covenant is, maybe you've given up on I'm asking, try again. But don't look for what you can get out of somebody. That's not covenant. Covenant is coming without an agenda for how can you help somebody else. And I promise you that when it, the Lord cements that and brings you together, it will sustain not only you, but the generations after you. And that's what my life is right now. It's for my kids to instill what's up here into them. Amen. Hey, you know what? Amen. <laughs> Hey, don't tell your dad this, but you're a better preacher than he is already. <laughs> I want to I say I agree with everything you said except for one word. You said that covenant sometimes hurts. No, sometimes. Always, always hurts. Amen. Ben. Yeah, I mean, I think that what you're getting a window into is the very tangible reality of these relationships. The depth of them is not a show. And um, we were teaching a emerging leaders conference a few years ago, and several of the leaders here have, have partnered in that equipping. And each time a new leader was introduced, the person who was introducing them was gushing, glorious about how much they loved this leader, how much they honored them, how much they honored the sacrifice, what they were involved in. And one of the couples who was there came up after the meetings and they said they felt very uncomfortable because of the amount of honor that was given to each of these leaders. And it got me to thinking that, yes, you know, when you walk in on a relationship where there's so much seasoning and hardship that's been overcome and commitment to be loyal even when it's difficult, it can almost seem like a cult. There can be a line where you, you feel like, if this is something I, I'm entering into, it's an intimacy, I don't get it. And if that hasn't been the context of your relationships, it can almost feel like there's a barrier to you being able to enter into that. I was thinking of a Thanksgiving meal, and we know the stereotype of the families and extended family members who gather together, and the meal starts out great, but then somewhere along the line, it turns to politics and religion, and then you see the tension building and the fighting start to happen and the yelling. But at what point when you're in those situations are you ever willing to say, that's it, I'm done with my family? I, I'm done, I'm getting up from the table and I'm leaving this relationship. And it helped me to recognize how much more true it is that we, when we are in one body as Messiah, there is a deeper level of covenant commitment one to another that even in the midst of disagreement, we say, I am not leaving this table. So much of Jewish culture and even more so Arabic culture is about the table fellowship and how many meals we've all shared together with the Lord is our discussion, with our families is our discussion. I have my wife and my son here with me. It's being passed along uh, generationally. But I've seen this now last for over 40 years in my life. I've seen it demonstrated and walked out. So I actually feel like it's become more natural for us as sons and spiritual sons than it was for them. I mean, the very first two or three pages in your book, Asher, you were ready to give up. That Aton and Asher were waiting on my dad. He was late to a meeting, and they were wanting to discuss something. And they were like, is this even worth it to walk into covenant relationship? We could have bigger ministries. We're in our prime. We can do this on our own. And they said, no. God is wanting something more that demonstrates his covenant faithfulness to us. When we share the DNA values of covenant relationships and pursue loyalty and integrity with one another, we actually demonstrate the faithfulness of God. 
And so you can hear it through all of the stories. There's so much we could be up here for a seminar, a whole conference just on this one topic because it's real. And so the invitation is this is not exclusive. You can demonstrate and model covenant faithfulness and loyalty one to another, whether it's among a leadership group or not. I do it with many other people that's expanded beyond who's on the stage. And so I just, uh, and that's my heart cry. I know that's everybody here. We want you to experience this. We want you to do the hard thing. You know, marriage is hard, but divorce is hard. Divorce is a very hard thing. So choose the right hard thing and pursue covenant. Amen. Then, you know, uh, I see something similar. You're already a better preacher than your dad, too. That's, <laughs> I'm loving it, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, I also want to honor your dad. You know, I, when, when I was just serving under him as, as, as his disciple, and we were talking about covenant, I remember saying to him once, Dan, you know, I, there's so many people. How do you decide who you're going to be in covenant with? This is a brilliant thing. He said to me, no, no, you don't understand. You don't decide. You walk with a covenantal attitude, and whoever wants to be with you is going to be with you. In other words, covenant is a, is a one-way attitude. It's not dependent on the other people. You say, I am choosing as my person. I am going to act as a faithful person. I'm going to act with integrity. doesn't matter if nobody else responds to it. How other people respond, that's something else. It's an attitude where you're going to walk in just those faithfulness and integrity. That's what you, you walk in that faithfulness to people, integrity in your actions, and it doesn't matter what other people do. How other people respond, that shows the relationship. That's a two-way street. But now, but I also want to say that, that you mentioned something about cultic. You know, look, I want to be honest about this. I've seen people around the world use my book and do things that I would consider to be cultic with it. So I want to warn you. That, that you're not making a covenant with somebody else so that you can manipulate that person to do right, what you want. Right. You're not making a covenant to make to to, for, to trick that person into having that he's got to be committed to you. No, 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 no. You're not tricking him to be committed to you. You're making a commitment to him to bless that person. And you always give the person freedom. Listen, you can walk, you can walk in, you can walk out. That's not the point. We're not making covenant with people to try to get them to do what we want. We're saying, and, and actually... If I would read, I really, it should say covenantal relationships. It means that I am committed to my relationship with you of acting toward you with integrity and faithfulness. It doesn't matter what you say. And I'm not trying to do anything to get you to do what I want. That's not what this is about. So I, I just want to make that clear. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about walking in faithfulness and integrity. And uh, good, Ron, go ahead. So I remember when my microphone was working. Can you hear me yet? <laughs> Okay, so I remember in 1987, I graduated from Bible school, um, and I moved down with Dr. Michael Brown to Maryland, where he was going to start a school called Messiah Biblical Institute and Graduate School of Theology. I was a student there, and I lived with Asher and Betty at that time, and Asher taught a class on a book that he dictated into a tape recorder, if I'm not mistaken, that was a manuscript. At that point, it was called Covenant Relationships, and I think it was had another name, Congregational Government, at that time, right? Okay. That was the name of the class. A handbook for Loyalty and Integrity. And there was probably six of us in this class. And when I graduated from Bible school, you know, one of the things we used to ask each other is, what is your ministry going to be? Well, my ministry, my ministry. Well, my I realized probably 10 or 15 years after being associated with tikkun, being inside of tikkun, being a leader in tikkun, that I, I don't use that terminology anymore. It's at a certain point that made no sense to me. The 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 my ministry syndrome, it just doesn't make. There's no such thing. In the new covenant, you have teams of men and women that are working together to promote the kingdom of God. There's no, that you don't, well, you actually do find the phrase one time in Romans 11 where Paul says, I make the most of my ministry to provoke other Jewish people. To, but he doesn't mean it in the sense that we do with the ego and the mailing list and the TV show. The, this whole my ministries, it just doesn't exist. We don't think about it. And as Asher was teaching that class, it, it was just so, you know, the idea of Governor David and Jonathan they made a covenant together. Like, I never thought of that. And that they, I mean, think of Jonathan. 
He had nothing to gain and everything to lose by covenanting with this, this kid, David, who was going to take his kingdom from him. And he says, I know you're going to be king instead of me. And that's cool. I mean, we talk about David. Jonathan is the hero of that relationship. It's how he humbled it. Why? Because he loved David. He loved David so much that the homosexuals twist the scriptures to say that they had an affair. That's because they don't understand covenant. They don't understand that two men can actually share a non-sexual love that is deep and intense and awesome. And as we're learning, we would have to stop him. I've never, so we would like, just stop, stop teaching, stop, five minutes, we need five minutes to, to just think, okay, start again, it was that intense, it was awesome, and we're looking, we had a manuscript, we didn't even have books, now just imagine, now I, I'm, I've been married, we just celebrated 35 years, and the reason that my wife and I are still married She's right there, and she's beautiful, and she's amazing, and, and I love her. But the reason that we're still married isn't because we have a perfect marriage. It isn't because she wakes up every day and says, I have the most awesome, handsome, amazing, smart husband. In fact, sometimes she might even throw things at me. Not lethal things, but the fact is, is that marriage is hard. The reason we're still together is that 35 years ago, we made a covenant to each other. Now, that's not abnormal. That happens all over the world. Half of marriages end in divorce, but half make it, at least in America. That's awesome. But what happens when leaders make that same type of a commitment? Now, I'm not saying that our relationship is as deep as marriage because that is the, the, the husband-wife relationship is the most deep or the deepest relationship that we can have on earth outside of God. But look where we are in, in, in America. with lead, it, You know, you offended me. I'm going to go start a church. I'm going to take half the church. Well, like it's nothing. See, in the ancient church, schism was like adultery. But it's nothing today. And I'm last, so I'm going to take the rest of the time. So just deal with it. But I can't split from these guys. It's like splitting from my brothers. I just can't do it. I can't, I cannot, maybe I could in the beginning, but I can't now. And I, I, I love in Lord of the Rings, you know, if, if you think of who is the hero of Lord of the Rings, nobody ever says it's Samwise Gamgee. It's Frodo, it's Aragon, but it's Sam. Because when Frodo, when he got deceived, when he couldn't carry the ring anymore, Sam picked him up and carried him. He was a nobody. He was like, what is he, a gardener or something? And he was, a, you know, in, in, the, in the shire. But what is he known for? He's known that he picked up Frodo and he finished the task. And Frodo didn't need him at that moment. He, he was mad at him and he hated him. And he says, I don't care. You can't get rid of me. That's covenant relationship. And I can look at the, the, these guys right here. Guy, don't give me tissues. I want the tears to be seen on the camera. <laughs> That's Ron. I can go down this... I've known Guy for about 15 years now. We have had some really good times, and we've also had it out a few times. But we really, really love each other. And I've known Troy since he was a child, since before he can remember me, when El Shaddai was started. And we've done ministry trips together, and we love each other. And Matt and I, we led a, a young adults group together, and then we did a DT, a one an awesome one-year DTS that then went defunct the next year. But many of those people are in ministry. And, and we're friends still today. And I love everyone in this family. And, and they did get a discount. That's why they brought so many people. So <laughs> they, 
To be clear, that was Ben's joke. I stole it from him. <laughs> and Asher, I lived with that from the time I moved to Maryland. Asher took me under his wing, and I lived with him and Betty, and I and I learned, and we're still together today. And Nathan, I knew Nathan. You know, I wish it was Joel here because Joel, his brother, when when my wife was his nanny, was their nanny, and when Joel saw that I was going to marry Ilana, and if you see if you see Joel, he's a very large individual, but when he was four, I could take him. And he was not happy with me. But that's how long I've known these guys. And, and I've known Ben. I mean, I'm, I forget that. I mean, it's so weird that we're almost the same age. But when I came to Beth Messiah, I was a young adult. And he was an older teen. And I've known him since then. And we've, we've gone at it with each other. And we love each other. And, and I know their dads. I know and Paul married me and Ilana. Actually, you know, Paul gave away. Ilana, because her father had just died, and Eitan Shishkov married us. I mean, this is family. And I remember when we brought Felipe on, it, when, it, remember we met in Miami, and you were looking for a job. And you would, you would come through, I, I'm sorry this is being filmed, but you would come through some difficult situations in ministry, and you wanted to make sure that you ended up in the right place. And I told you this is different. And I don't think you believe me, but I remember you came to me about a year later and you said, I never knew that it was possible to be in ministry like this, to be loved, to be appreciated, to not just be a worker. And by the way, if you don't know it by now, Felipe Hasagawa is the reason this conference has been so awesome. He... Stand up, Felipe. Felipe, stand up for a second. <laughs> When he came to us, let me tell you something, people that, that we got him, people wanted to hurt me physically. Like, I mean, he was something people wanted because he's so good at what he does. And we're so blessed, Felipe, that you chose us and that you're still with us. And, and he's just unbelievable. And the whole team that put it together. But anyways, just imagine if when you went to work in ministry with something, you, it wasn't a job. And it wasn't a stepping stone that you were really joining a family because that's what it's like. And families fight. They get mad, mad at each other. Remember, what was that movie where the guy eats the, you cut the turkey? That happens. You probably don't remember Boulevard. I think it was called Barry Levinson. Anyways, <laughs> don't cut the turkey. The fact that, yeah, we do have it out. But we're still, you don't divorce. You don't divorce because you get in a fight. And in ministry, people break up over dumb stuff. Dumb offenses. We choose not to get offended by each other. And if we do, we talk about it. And we're still together. So amen. Amen, amen.